1 Peter chapter 2 this morning. If you'll turn to verse 11 of chapter 2, 1 Peter. <laughs> Beloved, I urge you as aliens and strangers to abstain from fleshly lusts which wage war against the soul. Keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles so that in the thing in which they slander you as evildoers, they may, because of your good deeds, as they observe them, glorify God in the day of visitation. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether to a king as the one in authority or to governors as sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and the praise of those who do right. For such is the will of God that by doing right you may silence the ignorance of foolish men. Act as free men. And do not use your freedom as a covering for evil, but use it as bond slaves of God. Honor all people. Love the brotherhood. Fear God. Honor the king. In this section, Uh, Peter is giving us another reminder that we are just strangers here passing through. We need a constant reminder of that. That's why I'm grateful for the church. That's why we meet regularly, because we need reminders. The title of this message, like I said, is When in Rome, because normally we say, when in Rome, do as the Romans do, but this is not the case this morning. We are told, according to scripture, to not do as the Romans do. To abstain from fleshly lusts that are waging war against your very soul. Now these lusts include the things that we talked about last Sunday, the service in which you can hear a pin drop. Because the fleshly lusts are, not, are, are associated with us by, um, I'd say, stigma with the fleshly lusts, the stuff you don't want to talk about in a church service, right? The stuff you see on the media. But we are actually talking about, like last week, malice and hatred and bitterness, Those things hopefully that we're getting through because holiness is the theme of First Peter. Holiness is the theme. And sanctification, setting yourselves apart. Sanctification is not a pick and choose thing. Where we, in, a, in a, moralist, a moralist fashion, where you are boldly and proudly flaunting all the things that you do right, but inside we're defiled. This is why Jesus spoke to the Pharisees. He didn't hate the Pharisees. He wanted them to be holy inside. Jesus wants us to be holy inside. This is the call for us this morning. And we live in a, an interesting world because it is easy to become bitter in here where no one sees and become defiled inside while you still simultaneously are proclaiming righteousness and very, you know, very bold and, and standing up for what you believe in. It's easy to become defiled like this towards people in general, which Peter covers, towards other believers, which hopefully, you know, only the Spirit knows, only God knows, but we're working through some of those things. It takes time. Sometimes healing takes 
It takes time, but we, as long as we're working there, right? And then, of course, people in authority over us. Now, the Bible doesn't present a gray area. So from this, this point forward in the message, realize that what I'm about to tell you is apostolic. It is from, I'm not claiming myself to be an apostle, but it's coming from an apostle's teaching. That's why I'm here. I am teaching on, this church is called Foundation for that very reason. I'm not teaching on Nicholas's teachings because I want everyone to think like me. That's not possible. No, no preacher should do that, but they fail at it all the time. This is from the word of God. There is no gray area in this. Now, I'll remind you again, God directed Peter to write this to believers living in a corrupted Roman empire, hence the title, When in Rome. Now, God is still clearly speaking to us through his word and directing us to this in a now corrupted American empire. Or I'll call it a corrupted world empire, but we're, we're in the segment called America. The same problems are in the church today. And if you heed the warning and repent, as if, I, I mean, and I, I've, I've already done this, you will, you will see the Lord. If you don't, you're going to be defiled. It's, it's, it's clear. If we don't pursue peace with all men, if we don't pursue holiness, the Bible says, Hebrews 12, 14, pursue peace with all people and holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Looking carefully... Lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble, and by this many become defiled, the many is the believers. So what does this look like? Well, Peter tells the believers, mainly Jewish believers, but they're believers, to keep their behavior excellent among the Gentiles, among the non-believers. So that in the thing in which they slander you as evildoers, they may, because of your good deeds, as they observe them, glorify God in the day of visitation. There's missions right there. In our behavior, embedded in your character, is missions-mindedness. Because how I act in here, how I act out there, is everything is coupled with the Great Commission. Reaching someone else for the gospel. Once again, in context, look at the time period that this is being written and preached in. The church and the believers were under severe persecution. by the government and society. Christians were being killed by Nero. True story, this happened. I, I covered the human torches last Sunday. You know what else they did? Ani, you know what else they did? Making sure you're paying attention. They put... They put, listen, they put hu animal skins on people and then they threw them to the dogs so that the wild dogs would tear them apart and eat them, okay? This is what was happening. This is Nero's sick mind. He was one of the sickest kings in history. Also, he was sexually immoral. Also, he was a pedophile. He married a freedman, which was an emancipated slave, and then after that, he married a castrated young boy as his wife. Sporos. I think I'm saying that right. He dressed a young boy as his wife. Are you guys okay with that? Absolutely not. Okay, so picture all this going on. You're a Christian now. In the midst of that, let me read what Peter, the apostle, tells believers to do under the rule of such an ungodly, corrupt, sick leader. Here's what he says. 
Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether to a king as the one in authority or to governors as sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and the praise of those who do right. So number one is submit to authority. Now, many evangelicals read this verse, but we skip it. Because it's a hard pill for us to swallow. The nation, and I'll speak for our nation. I know a little bit about other nations. I honestly don't have that much time to follow too much, but I know enough. Our nation is heading into as much corruption as ancient Rome. But the command is still the same. We must submit to our governments and be, at least be well-behaved, peaceful, good citizens in the midst of all this corruption. We have to be just decent human beings. That was not easy for people in believers a day in, in, in Peter's day, for believers in Peter's day, I mean, they're watching their friends get, okay, burned like human torches. And their, their, their ruler has married a little boy. I mean, it wasn't easy for them. That's why Peter has to, and this is repeated through the scriptures, this isn't a one-time command. So it's not easy for us now. And don't for a second think it's easy for me. I grieve, probably on a daily basis, for the murdering of innocent children by abortion every single day. I grieve it. I grieve now for the influx of fentanyl allowed into our borders. And it is killing, ladies and gentlemen, 300 people a day now. You guys know my story, BC, I was addicted to heroin. I tried fentanyl once. Thank God I'm still alive. But back then, that was a long time ago. It wasn't where it is today. Just one taste for your son or your daughter or you, you could either die or you're going to have a real hard time. It's 10 times more potent than heroin. That's a lot. So I grieve at that because people are dying and they don't have a chance. Do they have a chance to meet Jesus? I don't know. They're finding them dead. Yes, it's here in Spencer. It's here in Spencer. I grieve any laws that are put in place that promote confusion and sin contrary to God's ways. Destroying our children's self-identity, their identity, and, and promoting godless marriages and, and godless homes. I grieve that. There is no doubt an evil agenda. I don't have to be a conspiracy theorist to think that. The agenda is written in Scripture. It's Satan's agenda. Still, in the midst of this grieving over sin, which it's always okay to do, we're called to be examples of holiness and righteousness in the midst of a corrupt generation without corrupting ourselves and defiling ourselves. Connect that to the root of bitterness that I talked about in Hebrews. Submit is a command. It's in the imperative. It's non-negotiable. So submitting to authorities... God expects us as Christians, especially, because we're setting an example, we have to submit to the laws of government, parenthetical, unless they're asking you to sin, I'll repeat that over and over again. That means local, that means state, federal, all of that. Also, the authority includes your employer. That's why if you're a Christian at a job, you are, uh, as you're maturing in Christ, you should have integrity. You should be doing the right thing when your boss isn't looking. When I see some of these young people, I've never seen Ani checking her phone when she, do you still work at Fairway? Okay, she's not, she's working. 
These young people, they have integrity. They should because they're Christians. They're looking to us to be good citizens. Sorry, I'm using you a lot. <laughs> Today I'm putting you on the spot. You're right there. You put yourself in the hot seat. Um, don't worry, I'll get my daughter next. So the church, within the church, now not lording over, you know, but we, we have leadership in the church, in the home, of course, your parents, respecting your parents. The, all these things were set up by God, the authority. The reason is self-evident. God instituted it all. God instituted government. God did this. Because without, the design is, without keeping laws, there would be chaos. No one would be safe to walk the streets, which in Spencer, we're pretty safe to walk the streets. I can leave my car unlocked and running at Hy-Vee, and it's a rare thing where anybody comes during the winter. I don't know, if that's illegal, then I need to repent right now. It probably is illegal. See, you just saw me repent. I got to look that up. Um, anyway, I can leave my car unlocked. That's not illegal. And I don't have to worry about somebody stealing anything. Our doors, we can leave unlocked, I mean, for the most part. Um, law and order, right? If there wasn't any government or law God instituted, there would be no police to protect us, no military. There would be no firefighters coming to put out that fire. You'd be left on your own. Without law, there cannot be a society. This is God's design. Doesn't mean it's not corrupted now, but it was his plan. It was instituted, the law, to keep people from becoming wild animals because we're corrupted by sin and just doing whatever we want. That's because chaos is not God's will. Chaos is not God's will. Law and order are God's will. When we submit to government, we are submitting to the will of God. And this is not an obscure verse either. Like I said, Romans 13.1 brings this up. Every person is to be in subjection to the gover governing authorities. There is no authority except from God. And those which exist are established by God. Therefore, whoever resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God. And they who have opposed will receive condemnation upon themselves. Now, lawlessness is increasing. We see that, right? I, I get people want to, they want to get rid of the police and get rid of all the things that God wants to establish. But this doesn't mean that we partake in that breakdown. Whether in Rome, uh, I don't know what Italy looks like right now, but America, communist China, believers are still supposed to be setting the example of, of obeying the laws set above us by that authority unless those laws are directly commanding you to sin. And there's your reason for civil disobedience. But how can we do this? There are so many evil leaders. Right? Some would say we have to use our freedom to revolt and stand up against these evil tyrants and I'm here to tell you today that the Bible does not teach that. Unless you misinterpret the word of God. It doesn't matter what angry, fired up pastor you have listened to. There are three institutions ordained by God. Number one is family. Number two is church. And number three is government. Parents are in a family to rule. Church leaders are to lead a church. I don't want to use the word rule, but, I mean, church leaders, we're here to shepherd over people's souls. I mean, it's pretty serious. And then we have the authority for the state and the nations, right? In all three, there's going to be good and bad leaders. It's going to happen. Unfortunate it happens in the church. So much damage. There's going to be bad parents and good parents. There's going to be good presidents and bad presidents, right? But those leaders will have to, listen, they're going to have to answer to God for what they did with the authority that was given to them. God gave them the authority. They're going to have to answer to God in the end. Our job is to submit to the authority. 
God will bring judgment, listen, folks, to every ungodly official, leader, pastor, parent. God will bring judgment. He instituted it. He will deal with it. So we can do little to change, really, as far as government, how they're handling their authority, aside from voting, of course, and we want, you know, if you're called to be a Christian in a political position, that's great, because, I mean, that's what Daniel did, right? We read that in Daniel. But remember how Daniel acted. He was honorable, he was respectful, he even had a relationship a loving relationship with these guys, but he ref when push came to shove, he refused to compromise, and he did it in a respectful way. It takes great spiritual maturity to do this, and our goal in any church, I can speak only for this church, is to get us to be spiritually mature. So we can only do so much to control what leaders are doing, but what we can control is our own behavior. We can control our own behavior. Are you, are you listening today? Are you tracking with me? Also, parents, we can control our kids' behavior, Sophia. Yeah, come on up. Come on up. I want to give an illustration. Based on these verses, she's 13, okay? How I raise her in my home according to the word of God and her relationship to authority is what is going to be produced in her. So, I can tell her, especially during election season this happens, right? Sophia, you see this? This is a tool of the enemy. He is an evil man, an evil person, and we don't even want to watch him. In fact, we're going to speak bad things about him. I don't care if he's the president, we're going to hate on him. Or I can say, Sophia, the Bible says we have to submit to authority. Even when there's ungodly leaders in office, we're going to pray for them. We're going to pray for our country. We're going to intercede. That's how we fight our battles. Because we don't serve man, we serve God. Got it? There you go. That's how you ingrain the right biblical way into your kids, or else I'm, I'm, I'm giving her my bitterness. I'm giving her that in me. It's going to my kids. And then they're wrapped up in a whole mess that we already have in this world. It's up to us parents. I'm speaking to parents. But then it's up to us to control our own behavior. We have to represent Christ and pray for leaders it doesn't matter if the elections were rigged or not. You have to pray for those in authority. It, it annoys us, but that's our flesh. And you have to separate the flesh from the spirit because we don't serve this ordinance in the end. We serve God's ordinance, his kingdom. And that's really going to silence the critics of Christ because they're expecting us to just be belligerent, hating Intolerant people, right? And I'm using intolerant in intolerating of other human beings. In a loving way. We tolerate the annoyances of people, the sin in their lives, so that we can reach them. We don't approve of their sin. That's not that kind of word, right? And we, when we buy into the antics of this divisive political game, it is a game, ladies and gentlemen. It is a game. If you think that these news networks care about you as a person, you are wrong. Jesus cares about you. We cannot follow these things as if they are idols and gods. When we publicly curse any leader in authority, that includes social media, and curse means speak evil of, and I'll prove it with scripture, we misrepresent Christ according to the word of God. We have to fight that carnal pull in us that wants to just Get angry. Even if you're seeing red and you're angry at the sin of the world, the Bible, not Nicholas, because in certain circles, here's my problem as a pastor, in certain circles in evangelical Christianity today, this message that I'm preaching, like I said, it's from the word of God, I will be accused of being woke for preaching this way. 
That word, woke, which I would say means approving of things that aren't of, of God, another kind of something that I'm against, or I'll be weak because I'm preaching. How can I be weak for preaching the word of God? It's not me anyway, it's him. He said it. And if that's weak, then call Daniel and call Peter woke and weak because they didn't cause a revolt or a revolution. No, they, they were both kingdom-minded. And Jesus changed them. Remember Peter who wrote this, he was mad too. He's like, no, you're not going to kill Jesus. I'm going to cut your ear off. What did Jesus do? He changed his heart. And now here he is telling the church, whoa, guys, hey, pray for Nero, okay? He's, yes, he's out of his mind. He probably acknowledged that at some point. How could you not? He's doing messed up things. But he's like, submit, pray for those in authority. If, if you really are excited about civil disobedience and that's what you're looking for, if you're excited about revolution, your heart is in the wrong place. Those things are allowed when you're directly being asked to sin. Example is, I don't, I, I don't even want to go back there. But I understand why so many were angry during covid and I, I guess, I don't know, I, I can't even imagine anyone telling us not to meet for worship. That was a very uh, a strange time. And I, I, I don't know, but it, it, for, for future reference, no one can tell you not to worship God or read your Bible or anything. That, that's just, you don't have to do that. But if you're like, oh, well, I can't wait till they tell me so I can rebel, that, that's your problem. You have an issue of maturity to deal with. The Bible says... We cannot speak evil of our leaders. Oh, my goodness. Are you sure? Are you sure the Bible says this? Exodus twenty two twenty eight. you shall not curse God nor curse a ruler of your people. Well, pastor, that's just the Old Testament. That doesn't apply anymore. We can speak evil of whoever we want. You're wrong. <laughs> Acts 23, 5, then Paul said, I did not know, brethren, that he was the high priest, for it is written, you shall not speak evil of a ruler of your people. So before that, in context, Paul was actually calling them whitewashed tombs, right? He was mad, and he's like, whoa, whoa, I'm sorry, guys. I just realized that the Bible, it's written that I'm not supposed to speak evil leaders. So Paul repented right there, right? Are you still tracking? Nobody's mad at me. In Peter's day, the citizens, the, the society wanted nothing to do with Jesus Christ or his demands for this holy living and self-denial. I mean, you come to Christ, it, it's like, okay, now we have to teach you about self-denial, denying your fleshly lust, and holiness. This isn't a popular message. It wasn't popular back then. It's still not popular now. The idea that someone should give all that they have and all who they are inside for the cause of Christ and evangelizing the world is not popular. You want me to give up my house and my material possessions to go evangelize? That's, is that really popular today? I don't know. We would have to be tested in that area. That was the last thing on, on these people's minds. That's why many hate Christianity because you don't get to do whatever you want. That goes back to law and order. We, if we just did whatever we want, we'd be, we'd be in big trouble. So the governments at that time and society, here's what happened. They set out to eradicate Christianity. Let me fast forward now to our time. They, I'll give a general they, I don't just mean one party or anything like that. I mean those people driven by evil are out to eradicate Christianity. You can, that, that's happening. So, Back then, though, they were actually killing people. They were actually killing anyone who refused to turn them away from, for, from Christ. And still the apostles commands the church, well, you guys, live as good citizens. So even if, if that happened on our soil, where they're here today and they are trying to kill Christians, the command for us is the same. We have to be good citizens. So if you want to vent and you want to cry out, if you want something to, to be bold against and speak evil of, um, speak evil against the actual evil, 
speak evil of the actual sin. Intercede and cry out for the lives of the unborn. Cry out for biblical marriage. This isn't compromise. Cry out, uh, cry out and represent what a biblical marriage is, what it is to be a man, what it is to be a woman. Stand up against Satan by living in holiness. Battling in the spirit and be violent. Be violent against the sin in your own life. Be violent against the sin in your own life. How unfortunate it is, and, and I've met nobody here, okay, nobody here. Different state. My friends who are believers and they're super amped up about everything, right? They're really angry. They're amped up about righteousness and I can't believe this agenda and this and that. And the very same people who are so vocal about denouncing that stuff, they are, have not dealt with sin in their own life. I think of one young man who tremendous bondage and struggle with pornography. And he ignored the sin in his own life, and his life was spent until he repented, uh, just blasting, 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 getting angry over other people's sin. You see that Pharisee nature in us? God wants us clean in here. Revolt against unholiness in your own life rather than acting out in anger towards others. The American freedom that we have, I value it. I, I, I cherish it. I don't hold it as a god. It's not an idol to me. Um, it may one day be lost. It may one day be lost like in North Korea. Do you know that in North Korea it's illegal to own a Bible? In North Korea, Christians who are discovered are either sent to labor camps or govern, as government, government prisoners for being a Christian, or they are killed. This is happening as I speak right now. I don't know what time it is in there, but somebody is, as a Christian is, is being killed, rest assured, or they're in a prison camp. And their families face the same fate. In that extreme case, this is an extreme case, if that happened here, you have permission, according to the word of God, if, if they come and say, hey, you have to denounce Christ or you're going to go to prison, they'll send me to prison camp. You can't worship God? Okay, well, um, you can't proclaim Christ in this nation anymore? Well, uh, but even still, I would, I would do it this way. Respectfully, is it Kim Jong-un? Is that his name? Kim? Okay. I would say, I would respectfully say, Emperor Kim, I won't bow to you. I serve Jesus, he's my king, and I will never stop serving him. And you know what, I'll, I'll probably get beheaded or killed right after that. So there you go. Very simple. I didn't try to kill him. I didn't try to, you know, hunt him down and all that. I just simply proclaimed Christ, and I died for the cause of Christ. And that really doesn't matter because we're free in Christ. And that's the freedom. Our freedom in Christ trumps any other freedom you can have. Even American freedom. American freedom, ladies and gentlemen, is temporary. American freedom is temporary. Freedom in Christ is forever. Get more excited about the latter. We are called to live as free citizens. Now we're free in Christ, but Peter's point is you're still bound to God, right? You're still a bond slave to God. You're a bond slave to his rules, which is be holy as I am holy, which is not harboring bitterness, which is all these things encapsulated in that. When we give our hearts to Christ, listen, we subject ourselves to the laws of God above all other laws. So one more time, if man's laws stand against God's laws, we must obey God rather than man. But we have to be careful because we have a danger now, don't we? Especially in our time, because we use that freedom, and this is exactly what Peter's talking about. It's so relevant. We use that freedom as a cover-up to act maliciously against the government. 
We cannot disobey laws just because we think they are unjust. They actually have to be unjust. Or just because we don't like whoever's in office or who is giving the law. Do you understand? So, we're servants of God now. You are not servants of your ideas. We are not servants of our thoughts, of our preferences even. We are servants of God. We are not servants to a political party. I know that is the least popular thing I could say on a Sunday. We're not. We're servants of God. Submit to governments knowing that we belong to an eternal kingdom under Christ. And all these nations, guess what? Including America, they're going to be counted as nothing in the end. Isaiah 40, 15. Behold, the nations are like a drop from a bucket and are regarded as a speck of dust on the scales. Behold, he lifts up the islands like fine dust. That's number one, submit to authority. Number two, honor everyone. Honor everyone. Honor everyone? What does that mean? It simply means you need to respect everybody. Every body, meaning a human body, meaning a human being, all humans. That includes the grocery clerk. That includes the the grumpy waiter. That includes the guy who cuts you off in traffic. That includes your neighbor with the weird little gnomes in their yard. And the neighbor whose dog poops in your yard. Regardless of the signs they have on their lawn. You have to honor and respect everyone. Remember, the early church was surrounded by immoral, drunken, belligerent, God-defying people, and still they had to respect everyone like we do. And why is that? Because every human being is created in the image of God. Every single one of you is created in the image of God. And their souls are of more value than gold, more precious than silver to God Almighty. So we cannot mistreat anyone, even if they're corrupt and vile sinners, because we're trying to reach people for Christ. We have to respect them. No one is beyond their, our, God's reach. No one is beyond reach. That's why Paul means when he says in 1 Corinthians 10, 32, give no offense either to Jews or to Greeks or to the church of God, just as I also please all men in all things, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of the many so that they may be saved. Paul never compromised into sin. Paul never approved of sin. He just respected all people. He was respectable. He treated people with dignity. Philippians 2, 3, do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. You have to, you have to just, you just have to honor everybody. You're not bowing to them. You're not, you just have to be respectful. Kind of like customer service training, right? Some of you guys are really good at customer service. When I leave, I feel, you know, hey, they respected me. Let's just respect each other. Number three, love the brethren or love believers. This is different. Peter says, love the brotherhood. This is more than just being respectful, just being cordial. More than treating human beings with dignity because they're made in the image of God. This is specifically for the family of God, which we are, Look around you right now in the service. Look around to your left, to your right. You're all family. You are a family. Brotherhood, sisterhood, whatever you want to call it, that's what it is. We have a special love towards one another. And it is the agapeo in the Greek. The agape, it's the strongest kind of love. It's the eternal love. We're supposed to be looking out for one another, encouraging one another, holding each other up, not tearing down helping and protecting one another, fellowshipping with one another, koinonia, special fellowship, praying and, we're praying and worshiping the God of gods, the Lord of lords together. That's an honor. You don't share that with just everyone. We have a bond in Christ. 
And we have to act like it because this is holiness. The love we have for one another as believers is a higher love than we can have than any unbelieving neighbor. It is a higher love. Yes, we, we honor and respect them, right? But we don't share this with them yet. Yet, I'll say yet because everyone has that. We want that opportunity, missions, 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 evangelism. So when we partake of criticizing and slandering and being divisive within the body, talked about it last week. I'm going to bring it up again. Peter's bringing it up, not me. Um, when we partake of that within the body, guys, especially, it's despicable in the eyes of God. It is, you can't even call yourself holy. It is unrighteous. It is sin. We are his bride. We're displaying to the fallen world around us, the Rome around us, the Babylon around us, what a family looks like in a world that no longer understands what a family is. We are representing what that means. Why, do th why would they want to be part of a family that is constantly bickering, that is constantly tearing each other down, constantly fighting in the body of Christ? They don't. They're not going to. They're not going to want to be a part of it. They already find that out there in the world. John 13, 34, you know it. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another, believers. Finally, submit to authority, even though your flesh doesn't want to. Honor all people, even though your flesh doesn't want to. Love believers, even though your flesh doesn't want to. Finally, fear God. Fear God. This is what Peter says. Now, fearing God is not even in the same league as honoring or respecting someone. Because no one deserves this word except God Almighty. If you want to know what's wrong with our culture and our society and our country and our world right now, it is simply a lack of the fear of God. This isn't a Halloween fear. This isn't a horror movie fear. This isn't a run and hide fear. Although you should have some sense of that if you're living in sin. You should have some shame or guilt. But this means in the Greek to reverence God, to stand in awe of him. This word expresses our adoration and worship. That's what we're doing. I know fear is associated with, there's a different kind of fear. This is not the kind of fear we're thinking of often in our humanity. Out of a fear of God flows everything we do. In fact, because of this, we must submit to authority unless they ask us to sin. We must obey laws unless those laws are against God. We must honor all people, and we must love our brothers and sisters in Christ. So we may be called to honor rulers or we give respect to those in authority, but we are not fearing them like we do God. This is only reserved for God Almighty. Matthew 10, 28 says, Do not fear those who kill the body but are unable to kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. It is because we fear reverential awe, reverential awe, that we pursue holiness. That is why we set respectful examples of, of who a Christian is out in society. That's why we're good citizens to the best of our ability. I get it. You go over the speed limit once in a while. I'm not saying that's not breaking the law, but... Thank God for his grace. We'd be in big trouble. Pay our taxes? Are we all paying our taxes? I hope so. Is that okay for a church leader to say? Yeah, it is. Live quiet, peaceable, peaceable lives for the sake of reaching the world for Jesus Christ. 
It is because we really worship an awesome God that we can do what Paul tells the churches in Thessalonica to do in 1 Thessalonians 4.11. And he says, to make your ambition to lead a quiet life and attend to your own business and work with your hands just as we commanded you so that you will behave properly towards outsiders and not be in any need. This, this world is the opposite of that. We live in a loud society. We make it our, our ambitions to lead loud lives in public and on social. It's the loudest chaotic mess that there is. And attending your own business, we have a hard time doing that. Half of our news feeds are gossip feeds. Almost everything you see, it's just criticizing, backbiting, bashing, bashing, bashing. And it's in here. And God wants it cleared out so that you can be holy before him. And you start to see even that president that you hate as a candidate for the grace of God. You know what I'm saying? Even that ruler, even the, uh, uh, who leads Russia? Putin. Wow, I need help, Lord. Right? You do, we need help, we need help. No matter what happens, what evil comes, or how much we are persecuted, no matter who gets elected, the commands are the same today. We are all called to this kind of lifestyle, ladies and gentlemen. Me, you, no one is exempt. Because I get this too. Well, pastor, that's for you. Because you're the pastor. Are you serious right now? Because I'm reading my Bible, and this is telling me this is exactly how to live. I have to, I have to submit to authority. I do. I have to be respectful respectable out there. I have to be kind to people. For every single believer, Peter was not talking to only pastors. The commands are the same today. Whether we are under a Nero, which, praise the Lord, there's no Nero right now, but whether you're under a Democrat or a Republican or a Green or a Purple or a Blue Party or a Pink Party, a Communist Party, a Socialist Party, or the king of England. We have to submit to authorities. Whoever you're around, respect them as human beings. Love every believer as your own family because that's what we are. Hallelujah. We are a family. And the world is watching us. The world is watching how we behave. And yeah, the church in America, we need to repent. I mean, we do. Every, probably every one of us in some area, we have to. Or we're going to find ourselves wondering why we aren't being used by God. His allegiance demands all worship, holiness, and glory. And that's because, worship team, come up. We need a song. Jesus will set up his reign. Listen, Jesus is going to set up his reign. There will be no more voting booths. There will be no more voting blocks. That's because the final vote has already been cast and paid for by the blood of the Lamb, by Jesus Christ. He is our king. He is our ultimate president. He is our ultimate authority. In your life, in the inner parts, in here, and forsake everything that doesn't line up with his will. Make him ruler of your heart. Be careful. Church, listen to me. I love every single one of you. Let me say, I'm going to say this humbly, and I'm going to look at all of you. I love all of you. Every single one of you. We are no better than anyone else, Megan and I. We forsook our families for the most part. We forsook our lifestyles to serve our king. We are warning this church body, you have to be careful how you speak of those in authority over you. You can do that in an uncompromising way. Like I said, it's sourced from the Bible, so I'm protected in anything I say this morning by the word of God. You have to respect everyone. Your neighbors are watching you. And you will be accused by other believers like my wife and I have. Because we love them and honored them, that makes us compromising. This is what we faced when God told us to love them. We broke through those things, and you know what happened after that? Freedom. 
influence holiness. Now, we don't have it all together, but this is what the word of God says. This is what we have to do. Election year is coming. Election year is coming. And every demon in hell, the demons in hell, here's what they want. They want you more concerned with all that's going on politically, and then you forsake repenting of the sin in your own heart. Because they, Satan likes to distract, bait and switch, sleight of hand. That's his goal, to distract you from holiness and righteousness. The church needs to understand this today. It's a wake-up call. Would you stand with me? Come on. Come on. We are in Rome. Make no mistake about it. We're in Babylon. We are not called to do as they do. Holiness means setting yourself apart from the depths of your heart. So rather than be quick to speak against others, ask God this morning as we worship. We're going to worship. This is like, this is heavy, I know. This is like, wow. Um, Ask God to search your heart. Ask God to search your heart. Say, Lord, help me. I need help. And he will. And you're going to, we're waiting for Jesus to rescue us. Not a president. Not an election. That's not going to rescue you. Jesus will rescue you. He's your salvation. He's coming for all those believers. He's going to lift us out. And then we're going to reign with him. There will be no more political parties. There will be no more kings or earthly leaders. So while we wait for him, we worship him. Worshiping in holiness, in spirit and truth. That's our call. Will you do that today? Just close your eyes all across this room. There's no altar call. Stretch your hands to heaven. God isn't here to bash you. He's here to help you. From the depths of your heart, respond to the Holy Spirit and cry out and wait for him to do what he does best. Rule his people. In Jesus' name, would you worship with us?